Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. How y'all doing, ladies? Good. How are you? Good. How are you? Long time no see. I know. I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, I felt like it's only been like maybe 50 minutes ago since the last time I saw you. <laughs> You've changed so much since then. I know, You've gotten I know. taller, I think. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you know, we got today, this is our second chief chat of the day. And you know, when we have two chief chats in one day, they got some heavy hitters. So uh, we got a legend today. So I'm super excited about uh, having a conversation with him today. So without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Today's guest is a longtime actor who stars in NBC's reboot of Quantum Leap, which premiered on NBC. He is also executive producer and star of the BET series, The Family Business, and known for his roles in many other projects, including Ghostbusters, Grace and Frankie, and Oz. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Ernie Hudson. Hey. Well, sir, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you. Absolutely. And it's a, it's a pleasure to meet you. And can you let our viewers know where you're joining us from today? Yeah, I'm um, in um, Southern California, uh, the Los Angeles area. That's where I, I we shoot the television show Quantum Leap. So I'm here in Los Angeles. So we'd actually like to start off by talking about Quantum Leap, which people are calling a reboot, but it sounds more like a sequel to the 1989 through 1993 series. So tell us a bit more about the show and I guess what excitement you're seeing from fans so far. Yeah, fans have been very, very excited uh, about the show. I didn't realize how really popular the original Quantum Leap, which uh, starred uh, Scott Bakula, uh, back in the 90s, um, but it's been almost 30 years. And so this is uh, sort of a continuation. It's not a reboot. And uh, I, my character um, has a history with the Quantum Leap. Um, and uh, he's in the military. He's a military man in the Navy. Uh, once he becomes an admiral, he hears about this program and gets the, um, the Pentagon to fund it and get it up and running. And so he runs the Quantum Leap program. Um, but uh, yeah, so the fans are very enthusiastic about it. We um, premiered uh, a couple of days ago um, and it's, it's, I'm really very, very happy to be a part of it. And you just mentioned your character, Magic Williams, was featured in an episode of the original series in which Sam left into magic while he was a Navy SEAL in Vietnam. So how does Magic's Vietnam experience influence his character in the modern series? Yeah, well, you know, uh, Magic got the name Magic from his platoon, um, um, you know, officer. He um, is a very intuitive guy, a spiritual guy. Uh, and when this experience happens to him, um, it, it just really confuses him. And so as he moves up in, t in the military, he um, finds out, what had happened to him and finds out that the program has now been shut down. So, and uh, Sam Beckett, who was a Scott Bakula character, has been left out. He's still out there somewhere. And so he's really committed to uh, finding Sam Beckett, bringing him back, um, realizes that his life was saved because of this leap. So um, he's um, very passionate about the program. Uh, and then what happens is our lead scientist, Dr. Ben Song, uh, who's played by Raymond Lee, he, um, he leaps without permission and throws everything off. And so there's a lot going on, but, uh, but Magic is, uh, yeah, he's a, just a very intuitive uh, guy who has a team of people that he feels are like family. And uh, this sleep is a bit of a, a betrayal, a bit of, he really doesn't understand what has happened, but, um, but it sets the stage for a lot of, um, a lot of things. And of course, the fascinating thing for me about this show is 
the leap is uh, he leaps into people's bodies and experience their lives from his perspective. And this, of course, is a time travel situation. So uh, we get a chance to look back at different time periods from the perspective of when they were happening, but also the empathy of being in someone else's shoes and um, yeah, and operating from that position. So it's a long yeah, winded answer. But... No, I oh, love no, it. No. <laughs> No, I'm still, I was thinking when you were uh, talking about uh, my man that jumped without permission, there's always one, there's always one that's just going to go against the grain and they're going to, they're going to mess up, (laughs) mess it up for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and when you really trust people, I mean, we're working on this thing. Um, You know, we have a mission. I think everybody's clear. Now, I'm sure he has a good reason for it, but we haven't found, it'll take us a while to find out what that reason is. And we can't really discuss it because he's trapped somewhere in the past, leaping from these various lives. And every week he is in a different situation. Um, And it's fascinating to see, uh, we talk about walking in someone else's shoes, but when you're literally walking in someone else's shoes at a time, and this is always at a time of crisis, um, we get a chance to see life from just a very, very different perspective. Uh, I wish we were able to do that. Um, I think we'd have a lot more understanding and compassion. Yes, yes, we we need that probably more than ever uh, at these times. Is it's yeah, you know. And I'm also I'm also uh, you know when I saw Magic Williams and, and you talk about it, he was given to him by his kind of platoon uh, officer or or sergeant. It's it it kind of takes me back to the call signs that we have in the military. So we all kind of develop call signs over the years and. Uh, I, I've developed, I've been a few call signs throughout my career based off of where I was or, or the crazy stuff that I've probably done. And it, and it kind of stuck with me. So, uh, magic yeah. is definitely a, a cool call sign to have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think he's very, very uh, proud of it. That's what, um, that's what he's known as, you know, his, his yeah. name is, is Herbert, but I think he prefers magic. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so you're also uh, executive producing and starring in BET's The Family Business. So tell us how you became involved with that project and how you balance working the two shows. Well, um, The Family Business, uh, there's a, a writer, Carl Weber, who's uh, also executive producer, uh, creator, writer. It's, it's, uh, he has a series of books uh, called The Family Business, and this show is based on those books. I'd read the books. Uh, found them fascinating. Um, it's about a family that owns the largest automobile dealership in the country. But uh, what makes this family interesting is their pursuit of the American dream. Uh, they feel they have to uh, get involved in illegal activities, drugs specifically. And um, so they're kind of a crime family and it's negotiating between all the different. So it's kind of a um, a godfather family dynamic, but what attracted, because that did not attract me, but what attracted me to this <laughs> is really at the core of it is family. And it's about this family that is unapologetic, um, but uh, a really, really, um, you know, strong and dynamic. And I hadn't really seen that in a lot of shows uh, when it comes to African Americans. So I wanted to not only be a part of that, but also see that uh, out there, um, so that, you know, people, you know, would be able to see it. So we're in our fourth season now. And, um, as executive producer, I really have no control over the direction that it goes, um, (laughs) which is becoming interesting, but, um, but I'm very, very happy, uh, for the family prospect of it. No, we're excited to check out, you know, the different changes with the family business as well. Um, So before we got came on air, we did talk a bit about when you joined the Marines. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And also the age of your son. All of us grew up with you, Mr. Hudson. So we know that you're, you know, you're seasoned. (laughs) But being seasoned, you're still super, super fit. Whether you were 20 or not, like you're super, super fit, even like you're knocking young men out of the water. So we'd like to hear a little bit more about your health routine. Like, what are you doing to stay so in shape? Do you have a special diet? Any type of thing that we should be incorporating in our diets as well? 
Well, I think it's um, as I've gotten older, you know, um, I think also being part of when I was in the, the Marine Corps, I become aware that uh, it's not so much what you do as, a, as what you don't do. So avoiding a lot of things that uh, that is just not really good for you, I think, just being being consciously aware. So if you make a choice, it is a choice, not something that, um, you know, you kind of, I did this, and I didn't realize what I was doing. So just being aware of your health, you know, we're all going to get older. We also know that yeah. at some point we have to check out. But until that happens, um, we want to make sure, for example, I'm not a big exercise enthusiast, but I do try to walk a little bit. I try to run a little bit just to make sure that I still can. Um, <laughs> there's a little routine that I do to make sure that, um, you know, doing a series of squats every day and push-ups to make sure that the body at least, just, just the common sense stuff. You know, my grandmother who raised me um, said that, um, you know, Jesus is the light of the world, but we're all lights of the world. And the, the most important thing is that we be an example of what was possible. And so I've always tried to live in a way that um, I was a good example. I'm an African-American older man, but I want to be an older man who who uh, has a little money as opposed to being broke, you know, who's healthy as opposed to being unhealthy, who, you know, who um, has set a positive, positive example because we hear so many uh, stories of people who uh, – have not been good examples. So when a kid said, is this possible? I want to have a career that says, yeah, if, if, if and someone looks at me, I'm, I don't feel I'm that exceptional, but um, I've always said, well, if that guy can do it, I know I can do it. So oh, yeah. um, just being aware of, I'm not going to put anything in my body that I know I'm going to have a hard time getting rid of, you know what I mean? It's, uh, yeah. you know, um, and if you make a conscious decision to do something, just know that own it, you know, yep. just, uh, yeah. I've always been able to own my choices, even though I haven't, you know, um, and I think one of the biggest things is to start, uh, transferring, um, the, or, or giving credit to someone else for what happens to you, because that is, um, I'm not sure if I answer the question. Yeah, just just living your life as best you can and being, um, you know, we, we know, you know, we, we read a lot of books, we see a lot of things, we're looking for answers, but it, yeah. it, within us is a voice. We really know what we need to do. Now we'll try to avoid doing it, but at the end of the day, you know, eating all that bacon is not going to be good in the long run. <laughs> you know that, you know, so... <laughs> So well, making it so good to your own voice. Yeah, I know it's so good. You know, but there's a voice saying that tells you, yeah, yeah. you really shouldn't right. do that. And uh, you know, when I was a kid, my my grandmother uh, who raised me um, uh, said that uh, God was my father, and the universe is very aware of me personally. It's not just right. um, just something we talk about, but it has a personal connection, and it will guide you. Uh, as long as you can quiet yourself enough to hear it. And so I've always tried to listen um, because there's, it, it, it will guide you directly where you need to go if you just trust it. Um, and I've always tried to do that. So, so I took two points out of that one, uh, Mr. Hudson. I got, I got accountability. And if you don't use it, you lose it. So, so yeah. take accountability and, and use it. And use it. And you know what? If you don't, that's okay too. But just yeah. just don't be mad at nobody because it's not working the yeah. way you want it. That's all. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so you mentioned your grandmother that raised you and uh and most or well, everybody that knows me very well knows my grandmother was probably the most influential person in my life. And uh, uh yeah. up until she passed, it was, you know, I I wanted to be just like her when I grew up. So uh, right. can you kind of let us in on, on how, how your grandmother influenced you? You gave us a couple a couple uh, stories, but uh, kind of overall, how much did she uh, influence your life? Well, you know, I, honestly, I, everything that's, uh, that I do, I still feel um, that uh, I wouldn't do anything too outrageous because I'd have to look at my grandmother and explain why I did that. 
Um, you know, I didn't have uh, uh, my parents in my life. Uh, my mom died when I was three months old. Uh, my father, um, she got pregnant away from the family, so no one knew my father. I never met my father. We did find him later on um, through Ancestry.com, one of those programs. But um, so I never grew up with him. My grandmother was my sort of, um, and she was very protective. I, I always felt I belong. Um, and she, I always, well, she was, and she would take the time to really talk to me about anything. Uh, she was very religious. Uh, I tend, I'm not, but uh, we spent a lot of time in church. And uh, when the, the ministers would give their sermons, she would take the time uh, after word at home and explain to me in ways that I could understand. Um, and she always listened. So um, I, I never wanted her to have to, um, she would stand up for me, but I didn't, I never wanted her to have to stand up for something that was stupid. You know what I mean? I don't want to say yeah, I yeah. did that. Now here my grandmother is. And so, um, if somebody backs you that well, you want to make sure that you're doing your part. But she was um, what, she was a lady who carried herself in a way that uh, the community really respected her. And I was always protected because people knew that I belonged to her. Um, I remember when I was a little kid, about four, uh, in the church, one of the um, sisters, <laughs> because I was acting up, she thumped me on my head and, uh, <laughs> and I cried. I just lost it. I cried. And my grandmother, who was way in the front of the church, got up and came back and asked her if she hit me. And the lady said, no, I thumped him. And my grandmother said, um, you know, he belongs to me. If you got a problem with him. You come and talk to me about it, but don't you touch my boy. And mm. so everyone just respected her. And, um, and like I said, I just knew, um, you know, I belonged to her. And she wasn't a big woman or a very, um, she was very soft spoken, but people, uh, the way she carried herself, I think people really yeah. respected her. So I, I feel like we're kinder spears because, uh, you, you know, your grandmother was a big influence. I, I, in your life and in my life, uh, you met your father. Well, you, you met your father through Ancestry. I just recently met my father through Ancestry.com as uh, well. Uh, yeah. You were a Marine. I, I was a Marine. Like I feel like we're going, you know, we're kinder spirits, but I think the only difference is our bank accounts. I think your bank account <laughs> may, may got mine just a little, just, just a tad. <laughs> well, you know, you, you, you never know. You know what I mean? You can never assume because, uh, yeah, but uh, as long as there's I, enough I can to make a, enough, a pretty, pretty yeah. good assumption. I, I, pr I promise <laughs> I, I can see mine every day. I... <laughs> well, you know what I mean? I got kids and relatives, so you can never assume yeah. anything. Uh, that's that's true. But uh, that's true. no, I've, you know what? I've um, I've never really had. We always have money concerns. I don't mean that I've never had money concerns, but I've never had a problem with money. And uh, I've also I think people always assumed even before I became an actor that uh, I was probably doing much better than, um, than I, I myself might've thought I was. I, I don't know why people always assume that I was, I was never, I don't think I've ever been perceived as a victim. You know, nobody's ever yeah. looked at me like, oh, he needs help. Um, yeah. and that's always been, it was always, I think as a kid, it was always important for me not to, um, you know, um, have people look at me like I'm somehow disadvantaged or something, you know, I'll carry my own weight. Um, and I think a little bit of it, you probably can relate to not having a dad, you know, and then people, oh, the poor kid who doesn't have a dad or something, yeah. you know. Um, and I think my grandmother's religious perspective in the sense that once as a little kid, believing God is your father and God controls everything. I mean, and at best my father and I can ask if I really believe that, then anything is truly possible. And I don't really have to bow down to anybody. Um, she made it clear that uh, nobody is below me, but certainly no one is above me. Yeah. And uh, that's was very, very important.
And we discussed this earlier, but you were also a Marine and you were discharged on medical grounds, which you shared with us before we hopped on. Um, and even though you were only in the Marines for a short time, how did your time in the service help form who you are today? Yeah, it was, um, I, I, I joined the Marines. Um, I quickly became the um, platoon guide and uh, I was, um, you know, really kind of finding my place, finding, you know, that, that sense of company, family, that connection. So the discharge really came as a huge surprise, even though I will say um, I probably should have studied harder in school because my geography wasn't really clear. I never heard of Vietnam until I got to the Marine Corps. And then they started talking about <laughs> Vietnam and a war. And then I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Nobody told me about a war. What, what war? But uh, this was in 64 when it wasn't that well known. But, um, but I think that the realizing that um, you can be a part of a team and you can, you know, you can work at something and excel. Um, uh, and it was always important for me when I was in the military to, you know, to, to be at the top of, uh, there might be one or two guys who could do something, but not, you know, 20 guys. I'm not going to be yeah. at the bottom of that list. So uh, <laughs> and I think I've always carried that. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, you, cause you mentioned you actually joined before, before you were even old enough to join, right? Yeah, I, I grew up in um, uh, Michigan, a town called Benton Harbor, Michigan, a very, uh, you know, it was a very poor area. And so for me, the only outlet that I could see um, to a better life was through the military. So uh, I wanted to join the Marines. Uh, you know, when I was in my senior year of high school, the uh, I got the brochures from the Navy uh, the Army, the Air Force, and they were all these sort of green and gray brochures. And the Marine Corps sent that colorful brochure with that dress uniform. And I'm like, oh, oh. yeah, yeah, that, so, that gets them every time. You know, yeah, that brochure. I'm like, I want to wear that, that uh, you know, um, uniform. And um, so I went uh, in April. I, we hitchhiked, me and a couple friends, to Chicago. And we signed up, and they were very kind and patient to wait for me until I finished high school to uh, take me away. And um, that was very exciting. I planned to see the world and do all kinds of amazing things. Um, and I, uh, when I got out of high school, I went over to Chicago. We caught a plane to San Diego and I got off the plane and I thought I was in a nightmare. I mean, it was like, oh my God. Was, I know you remember those, that first, you that, know. Those that yellow first footprints. Night, yeah, the, all the footprints. Step out oh, on those yellow God. footprints. Yeah, I kept going, oh God, let me wake up. It can't be, and it was, <laughs> this was in 1964. So they, the Marines didn't play around. I mean, this was oh, serious. Yeah, 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 you're right. Um, it was a real transformation, but, um, but you know, you learn and you grow and, and you deal with it. And honestly, when the, um, uh, the reaction to the shellfish and, uh, I, if somebody had told me, uh, before that happened that I would not be in the Marine Corps for 20 years, I wouldn't have believed it. But then that kind of came out of, uh, my grandmother say when I, when I came home, I didn't let anyone know I was coming home. And yes. uh, when I got off the bus, there's a field you had to walk across. And as I was walking across the field, and you could see our house, and my grandmother was out hanging clothes on on the clothesline. Mm -hmm. And when I I got up to her, she said, uh, "There's uh, there's some dinner on the table." And I was like, "Oh, how did you know I was coming home?" She said, "I, I prayed." So oh, maybe all this oh, happened. Wow. She felt it all happened because God worked, yeah. you know, the way it should. So um, whatever, uh, I, by the time I would have uh, finished uh, my four years in the Marines, I had graduated from college. So that was the direction I was to go in, you know? Yeah. My, well, my, my grandmother wasn't thrilled that I was, uh, uh, I joined the Marines either. So I'm sure she was praying for me to, 
to, to eat some shrimp and, and come home as well. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but when you were telling the story, all I can picture is a, a 70 year old Ernie Hudson on the side of the road hitchhiking and somebody pulls up and say, where do you want to go? I want to go to the recruiting station in Chicago. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know, I went with two friends and, uh, yeah. one, we went in on the buddy, buddy plan. Our third friend who was, he was a great guy, uh, wasn't the best student in school, but he failed the test. So oh. when we had to hitchhike back to Michigan after joining, um, it was really spending a lot of time consoling him because he wasn't able to go. But me and, um, uh, uh, my one friend, Ralph Pringle, uh, we went together on the buddy, buddy plan and, um, he actually went to Vietnam and was injured, um, had a lifelong injury as a result of it. But, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a different time. Now my yeah. grandmother who wasn't thrilled about the idea of me going to the Marines, but she sort of understood that when I didn't go to the Marines, I came home and a girl I had been seeing, um, was in a really difficult situation and I committed to marrying, which my grandmother was totally opposed to. So I think at the end of the day, she would have rather I'd spent four years in the Marine <laughs> than to marry that girl. <laughs> she was not happy with that, but you know, that's yeah. another story. <laughs> Listen, it, it all works out. It, it, everything happens for a reason is what, what the, what the old does say. So. It does. But then, well, the, so, uh, so now we, yeah. no, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it, it all works out, you know? So I, I was, she was saying, please, please, baby, don't, don't, don't marry this girl. And I married her. We had two, had two boys and then the marriage ended. So I was a single dad and, okay. uh, she would look, she would never say, I told you so, but she would look at me like, okay, well, <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, yeah. So, but gr grandmother, you you her baby, and so whether somebody thumping you on your forehead or or, or not taking care of you in a marriage, she gonna she gonna know that from a mile away, or she gonna feel that in oh, her yeah. spirit from a mile away. Oh yeah, yeah, no, she uh, and you know she was very. Uh, it was interesting because when she died in 1979, there was so many people. The 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 service it was I don't, hundreds of people came and. And they all had stories and I, you know, when someone is so personal to you, you think they're yours and you know everything about them. And people would come up and tell me stories of her and how she was there in the community that I just, I, I just had no idea, you know, uh, how we connect pe to people. And she was really amazing. Absolutely. So let's transition to the Ghostbusters movies. Cause you know, everybody loves Ghostbusters. It is, you know, you, you are synonymous uh, with that movie. So how often do fans come up to you on the street and start yelling out random lines to you from, from the movie? Well, it used to be a time, not so much now, but for a long time. You really, this is almost 40 years that no matter where, if I was just out and about and doing at some point before the end of the day, somebody would drive by and yell, hey, Ernie, who are you going to call? Um, you know, or they would say lines from Ghostbusters and, and I always, uh, I guess I always appreciate it. I always try to respond. Like I never heard it before. It's like, Oh, wow. You know, it's like, <laughs> how original, <laughs> but, uh, people, people love the movie. And we, uh, in fact, I just, uh, had a conversation a couple of days ago with Jason Reitman, who produced and directed, uh, Ghostbusters afterlife, um, that came out of last year. Uh, but uh, Sony has just approved uh, the new script, and so there will be another Ghostbusters. We'll probably start shooting next year. Woo! Um, and that's really exciting. <laughs> yes. I'm, um, you know, but um, I'm just so thankful to uh, to have been chosen to be a part of that. It was challenging uh, in a lot of ways, but um, you know, that's another lesson from. You know, talking about learning from the military is um, things may not appear the way you want them to be, but um, things have a way of working out. So now, almost 40 years later, I'm really thankful that I did the movie, you know. No, and we also mentioned a bit earlier how Quantum Leaps is, you know, it has that fan base, but it's continuing to grow in a new era. 
Um, and you mentioned that fans of the show have just been so vocal and so excited about it. But something we haven't really talked about is your reaction to your own acting career. So how does it feel? Like, do you feel like you always knew you would be such an impactful actor in the world? Like, is it exciting to see, you know, all your fans so excited about the projects you have coming up? When you first started acting, was that a, even a thought in your mind? Well, when I first started acting, um, I, I, like I said, I got married and um, my wife and I, we were in school and uh, I was just trying to, I worked all kinds of jobs just to pay the rent, you know, keep gas in the car. Um, and it was a real kind of struggle. I didn't feel I had a place. I hadn't found my place. And when I got out of the military, I really, cause that was my one plan. I really had no plan. Um, but I saw a play and I was blown away by it. And I thought, oh my God, I mean, to be able to do that, to be an actor, that is, I mean, that was something bigger than life. I couldn't even, I couldn't even ask that prayer. And uh, yeah. when I got into college, my, I, I needed an elective and they had an acting class. And when I walked on stage for the first time, I felt like, I felt at home. I thought, okay, I, I got this. I, you know, and my prayer was God, if you just bless me to do this, I promise I'll work hard at it. I'll show up on time. <laughs> I will give my best because I, this makes sense to me. I mean, I can do this. You know what I mean? Sometimes people say you do what you love to do. And I say, do what you can do, what you, I mean, it, it, acting makes sense. All the other jobs I had, I felt like I was going to be fired as soon as they find out that I have no clue what I'm doing. Um, uh, and, uh, that was back in the sixties. I've always made a living as an actor. I've never had to wait tables or do anything else. Uh, and I've always been blessed to work. So when you ask, I don't know, I mean, I feel like I'm just kind of getting started. You know, I'm, I know people see things I've done, but I don't feel like, uh, my career is kind of different because, you know, I don't have a Academy award or I'm, I just, I'm a working actor. I work, I do the best I can, but it's a job. The most important thing for me is, you know, my family, my children, um, my friends, my relationships. Acting is in some ways no different than if I, I don't know, worked at a, uh, an insurance company or, um, you know, any other job. This is, this is what I do. Um, and the rest is my life. So, uh, sometimes people in a, a confuse the characters with me, but I'm very clear on that's work and that's not who I am. And but I, I don't know. People tell me stories, and I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how people receive it, the impact that it has. Um, I'm happy, but I don't. I don't. I can't say I understand it. I'm, I'm thankful, but. Does that make any sense? I mean, I oh yeah, no, I, it does. Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm happy to have a job. You know, this <laughs> they're paying me to do this. I mean, so yeah. it's a good thing. You know, now, I've had friends yeah. who've been become huge stars and made just money that I can I can hardly imagine. Um, maybe if that had happened, I mean, I make a good living. I've always made a good living, but. Um, um, you know, I mean, I, Billy D would tell me about women passing out, you know, when he <laughs> smiled at them. <laughs> Only time women would pass out with me is if my wife is with me. But somehow women <laughs> behave very differently when my wife is there. And I have to say to her, honey, this never happens, I promise you. But um, yeah, no, I, I'm, it's a, it's a wonderful profession. I've traveled the world. I've met people that have, Certainly wouldn't have met if I had stayed in Benton Harbor, but at the end of the day, it's it's a job. And so with that, so you've done so much movie and TV work. Um, what are some projects you've done that you wish more people would discover? Well, it's kind of hard to say because you sort of, you know, it's almost like you can't, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I didn't know Ghostbusters would be 40 years later, we'd still be talking about it. And, um, so people will find it, they make it whatever it, it's uh, to become. Um, I did a movie called Clover with Elizabeth McGovern. It was a 
I think a TV movie, it was one of the things that felt, you know, better by and about, and I wish people had seen it. I did a movie a couple of years ago called To Hell and Back. It's kind of a weird title, but I love the work on that. But things that I think um, I'm feeling good about, uh, people may not, and things that I would rather people tell me it changed their lives. So it, it really is a personal experience. I think when we see movies and television, it's very subjective. And they, it reminds us of something in our lives and all of our lives are different. Uh, I, I look back on my life and some of the most powerful things happened came from people you'd least expect it. I remember uh, there was a, a guy, he was a deacon, he wasn't even a minister, but he, he it was a situation I was very upset and uh, I did something I didn't want to do and he told me, do it anyway. He said, the Lord will bless you. Now, growing up in church, everybody says the Lord will bless you. But the right. way he said it, you know, it just, it registered and it was life changing. And sometimes, you know, the universe speaks to us through situations, people. Um, and I also think in movies, because movies go all over the, I've traveled to Africa, to Europe, uh, Asia, and people will see movies that I had forgotten I even made. Um, and, and it's their favorite movie. And that's, so I, I never really know. Um, a lot of it I forgot. I had an argument with a guy recently about a movie I did. Uh, he said, yeah, I saw you in that movie. I said, no, I, I, I wasn't in that movie. He said, yes, you were. You did the thing. I said, no, I wasn't. And he started describing the scene. And I went, oh, my God, I did do that movie. <laughs> so, so, I, I just do it and try to uh, try to give thanks and keep moving. Yeah. Man, you, you've done so many movies, you're forgetting which movies you were in. That's that, that you are definitely a work, the, a working actor. So uh, we appreciate I'm you. a working actor. That's that's how I see myself. I'm a working actor. Um, blessed to work during times when there was very little work for black actors. Somehow I would always because I was a single dad. Uh, for me, it was important that my kids believe as best they can in the American dream, that they know things are possible. And I didn't want to give up on my dream and then say to them, they can do anything they want to. So it was important for me to, um, you know, to keep working, um, uh, you know, to succeed. And I, I would always say, I'm not trying to get, you know, a hundred jobs. I've seen one job, just, just one. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was always my mindset. Just, you know, I'm talking about everything. I just need this job right now. Um, and I'd go into auditions and uh, they would say, well, thank you, Ernie. Thanks for coming in. But I know I hadn't registered. And I kind of go, no, no, no. We're going to do this again. I'm not leaving here until you, you know. I'm, I need this job. My kids got to, yeah. you know, I got to get the bicycle. So I, I have to work. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So before Ghostbusters, you appeared in a lot of TV series, episodes, and in movies. So what what's a fun or funny memory you have from early in your career? Well, you know, they're all kind of different. And, um, you know, I think um, coming, I remember the first, one of the first jobs I got, it wasn't the first uh, job, but I, I came out here, worked, went to Minnesota, did some theater and some other things. And... Um, and came back. I was looking for an uh, an agent. I got a uh, uh, a meeting with an agent. I went and met him. He wanted me to come back and prepare a monologue. And he had all the other agents, about five of them. They sort of gathered in a room, and I started doing this monologue. And uh, in the middle of my monologue, he got a phone call, and so he he answers the phone. And while I'm in my monologue. And he kind of turns his back to me and and I wanted to say, wait a minute, man, that's disrespectful. You can't do that. I wanted to, I was really a, kind of offended by it, but I kept going. And uh, almost at the end of my monologue, he raised the phone up in the air and he, and he says, louder, louder. So I got louder and finished my monologue. He says, he's great. He's great. I'll tell you, the guy's really great. And he hung the phone up and he said, you just got your first job. And so that wow. was, I think I've been in LA like two days. And so 
Uh, I went to work. I'm glad, was, you uh, I'm glad you didn't cuss them out. I'm glad you didn't cuss them out like <laughs> yeah, you I told you to. That, and the lesson is there are times when you want to curse them out. Just, just you know, keep focus on what you're doing because Absolutely. if you follow that first spirit, and you will never know what would have, you know, what could have happened. And I wanted to. I wanted to stop and say, you know, when you get it together, I'll come back. But uh, and I think it was a television show called Serpico with. Uh, David Bernie. Um, and then I just started working. So yeah, sometimes you have to, um, you have to keep, keep you on the prize. Yeah. Keep you yeah, on keep the prize. You on the prize, you know, um, you know, it really is a, a, you know, our journey is, is a mental journey, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. So I want to share just a few comments with you from our viewers. And um, Marisa okay. Behar says, hi, Mr. Hudson. Thank you for making your wonderful movies. I look forward to seeing the new Quantum Leap. And um, Julie says, I ain't afraid of no ghost. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark says, Warden Glenn from Oz is his all-time favorite. Oh, Let's see. Yeah. Lots of people saying, who are you going to call? Lots of those. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary says, Mr. Hudson, you're, you've always been one of my favorite actors since I was a little girl. And then we have a question from Shelly. So she says she loves you in Grace and Frankie, which I ended up watching Grace and Frankie a few months ago, not a few months, but more like six or seven. And um, I had gotten, had like a bad breakup. And I was like, I want to watch a show that's like about older women, like a different side of being a woman in the world. And so yeah. that show is just awesome. I love it. And she wants to know how fun was it for you working with that cast? You know, I love, uh, first off, all these people I've been a fan of since I first started. You know, Jane Fonda was... Um, you know, I, Barbarella and all those early things she did. So I, I admired all these people when I was just sort of beginning and getting in the industry. Um, and to get a chance to work with them, Lily Tomlin, I have so much love and respect for. Um, even though I will say when they uh, first called me about it, because I'm probably as old as those guys, I just don't see myself that way. And so when they yeah. said I was going to be Lily Tomlin's love interest, I'm like, are you sure? Because I mean, Lily Tomlin's daughter's love interest. I mean, I'm, but, <laughs> but it's not that much difference at our ages. So, but I love, you know, I love people who are good at what they do and they, and they're humble. You know, and most of the people yeah. who are really show up and do the work, the people who have um, I've worked with who have a, a hard time and are difficult to work with are people who are really insecure about their work. And these yeah. are people who are on point. Uh, Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, um, uh, Sam Watterson. I did, um, um, what is it, L.A. Law, uh, not L.A. Law. Um, <laughs> once again, I forgot. Uh, I did a Law and Order. I did Law and Order. <laughs> and, um, and so I, know, I knew him, Martin Sheen, I knew for a while. But he's a really, really people at the top of their craft and they've been around and I just have so much uh, respect uh, for, and I'm so thankful to. And what I loved about Grace and Frankie was I didn't have to be, um, I, I could, it was a character as close to me as, as any character I've ever done. So he was just a guy, he wasn't a bad guy. He wasn't a, he was just a guy who um, just like this lady who was, this quirky lady and uh and it was fun just to just to play and and it was very very special so speaking of other roles um robin says napoli ever after was good i love how you played an older man making it in modeling have you ever modeled in real life <laughs> no i've never modeled and so when they they called and said um, i'm going to model in my underwear and you know, I'm like 73 years old. I'm like, really? In my underwear? Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, they said, you know, oh, you'll, you'll be fine. You know, so, um, and of course, when you start shooting right away, you don't have time to lose weight or do anything. So it's just kind of you. So, and it's going to be on a billboard, which was, <laughs> it's one thing to take a photo, but yeah, it's going to be on a billboard. And so when we got ready to do the, um, the scene where the billboard is in the back, I go to the set and I look up and this huge billboard is me in my underwear, um, which was, which would have been okay, except they didn't touch up the photo. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, so like, like all the little, uh, what do you have, the little crepey skin. And I'm like, well, come on now. You could have cleaned that up. I mean, you could have done a little, you know, but they <laughs> all just, these, all they these just took the photo. The world. All these pictures yeah. they use in the world on these cameras. Yeah. Come <laughs> on. Love. I mean, it's like, it's, so I'm just there leaning back with uh, everything hanging out. And, um, <laughs> but it's, um, once again, that's why you want to make sure you keep walking and you keep eating right and you jog right. a little bit because you never know when somebody's going to ask you to get in your underwear and take a photo. So there you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and play it all over the world. That's the other side of it. Like, oh my God, everybody's going to see this. Um, so I don't know. But I've never had anybody uh, say anything bad about it. So it must have been okay. <laughs> And Lynn Whitfield, who played my wife in that, we did a, a movie during the pandemic um, with Nicolas Cage called Retirement Plan. So I really love her a lot. And uh, it was really fun to, uh, we shot in the Cayman Islands and it was fun to um, get a chance to play with her again. Yeah, so just a few more comments for you. Um, Marisa says, Ernie, I read that you studied and started as a writer. Do you still do any writing, either professionally or just for fun? Well, I'm, uh, I've been talking about writing my um, autobiography. Um, haven't quite finished it. I started out really uh, as a writer, as you mentioned. Uh, I went to Yale. Not the smartest thing to do. Um, haven't been able to write anything since. But, uh, also, I think uh, being a single dad, writing, um, it takes a longer to really uh, get paid, whereas acting is more immediate. Uh, and I mm -hmm. sort of put writing off until I got older. Well, I'm older now, so um, I'd like to, uh, I'm focusing now on, you know, I think as you get older as well, the age that I am now, there's a part of you that says, I don't really have to do anything. So I go, I got to write this thing. And there's another part that says, why? You know, Ernie, you, <laughs> just sit down, you know? Because <laughs> um, when you're young, I got to do it because I got to make this money. Or I got to, there's a reason. No, it's like, no, nah, not really. I'm good. So uh, getting the motivation to, people say, what about your, uh, what about your legacy? I'm like, you know what? I don't think it's going to matter. Uh, but I, I would like to write my um, two things. I like to write my autobiography. I'd like to actually finish it because I've always been written a little bit along. And um, also, I think there's maybe a story. I keep waiting for that character that will really define my work. I've never had a great role in film. I did on stage. I did The Great White Hope. But in film, I haven't had that. And it might be necessary for me to create that project. Um, but we'll see. So I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever write again, but every single day I feel like I should write. And that's, I don't know how healthy that is. Yes. And then lastly, Mark Lucatorto says that he loved you in psych. Um, him and his wife watch that all the time. <laughs> yeah, psych was fun. I, you know, uh, Dulé Hill, who uh, was a little kid, did a movie called Sugar Hill, and he was a little kid in Sugar Hill, and now he's mm -hmm. he was doing Psych, and they asked me to come on and play his dad with Felicia Richard playing my wife, and it was really, um, had a lot of fun. Uh, and then they called me to do another episode, but I was working on a film, and they said they'd wait for me, but they didn't wait for me. They got Keith David to play my character. So Dulé had two dads and they said, and I saw them, I said, well, wait a minute, I thought you were gonna wait for me. They said, oh, it was okay because um, the actor we got looked exactly like you. And I go, well, it's <laughs> Keith David, he didn't look exactly like me. So uh, that's the other thing as an actor, people will tell you, oh, this guy, he looks exactly like you. And I go, really, is that what I look like? <laughs> um, in uh, in um, a billboard family see. business, Stan Shaw plays my brother. And they say, oh my God, I can't tell you guys apart. And I go, really? Uh, <laughs> 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 okay. 
That's funny. And so where can we find out more about your work and your causes and everything Ernie Hudson? Well, I don't, uh, I don't know because I mean, I have social media, I have uh, what Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and, but uh, I don't really hardly go there. And, uh, but uh, there, my son will, you know, there are people who will do whatever, but yeah, I, I missed out on technology, you know? I mean, my wife has to turn the TV on. Honest to God, I get, it gets smart TV and I go, I don't know what you is thinking. And it gets so frustrating. I bought a, I bought a new car, which I, I like the car, but I don't know how to turn the temperature up. And I don't know how to get the volume up. It's like, this. that's when I feel old. I feel like I'm, I'm missing out here, you know? I'm doing this on my iPad because my laptop is a password. I try to put the password in and, and then I have to call my kids. You know. <laughs> Andrew, if you turn the TV on, it's, it's anyway, to answer the question. Yeah. So if uh, they go to my, um, my social media, uh, I'll hear about it through my son or somebody will tell me, but I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not friending. I'm not, I'm just, you know, which is studio hates because they want me to, they say, Ernie, you'll tweet all this. And I'm like, you know, not really. I'm, and most of the people my age, that's kind of where we are. I think we missed out on technology, um, you know, and I think young people are, you, they don't understand that you're born into this, you know, this is a yeah. dream, you know, 50 years ago, but now you're born into that dream. And so you understand it. You know, I, my, my, uh, my grandson, he, he was born knowing how to type. I don't know how that happened. You know, when I was yeah. a kid, you had to take typing in class and you had to Absolutely. just to learn how to, now they just know it. They just, uh, so. Well, I thought I was really is. good. I thought I was really good with technology. And then, um, I was struggling with, I was ordering something with my niece who is eight. And I was like getting confused and she got so frustrated. She's like, you know what? Just give it to me. Let me do it. And she just, boom, 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 boom. boom. And I was like, oh yeah. no. Like, and they were born with like iPads in their hands. And I'm just like, yeah. And then she asked me for something once. And um, I was like, I don't have that. And she goes, you got Amazon on your phone? I was like, yep. She goes, you can order it and you can get it right away off Amazon. I'm like, you're eight. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they, they, they know, um, you know, and whenever I see my, my granddaughters in New York, the TikTok, we got to do a thing. <laughs> uh, so I'm, like, really? <laughs> I'm lost, you know, that's, uh, and when I see an old person doing that, I, I'm like, I'm shocked. I'm like, oh my God, how do you, how do you do that? Of course, uh, sometimes, sometimes old people aren't as old as I think. I mean, I see old people who say, oh my God, Ernie, I've been watching you since I was a kid. And I'm like, really? Because you, know, <laughs> you're looking pretty old, but uh, you know, when you get to be older than everybody else and you know, so, uh, but yeah, no, I, technology is, um, but if they reach out, I will hear it through my son or my agent. Somebody will let me know. Gotcha. Perfect. So, so if you're looking for Ernie, he's not going to be in the metaverse. You got to meet him somewhere else. So, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so for our Chief Chat viewers, you can find this episode as well as past Chief Chat episodes on YouTube and Spotify. Uh, tune in at 11 a.m. Central on 27 September uh, when our guest will be J.J. Perry, longtime stuntman and director of Jamie Foxx's Netflix action comedy, Day Shift. And sir... Mr. Hudson, we appreciate you for being on the show today. We had a, a great conversation. Uh, I talked, I, I took a lot of mental notes on, uh, on how just to, cause you seem pretty carefree about you just, you know, you just happy to be living and, and, and doing what you do on a, on a consistent basis on, on, on still on a, on an excellent level though. Like you still on the top of your game, you, you on goat status is what, what, uh, what I, what I read somewhere. So I don't know how many times people call you the goat, but we're going to give you one more goat uh, compliment over here at uh, Chief Chat. Well, thank you. Thank you. And um, no, I really, I appreciate talking to you guys. Um, I just feel very, just very, you know, there's a saying, how do you find oxygen at the bottom of the ocean? And the answer is 
you have to bring it with you. And I find in life, uh, how do you find peace? How do you find love? You have to bring it with you because if you're looking for it out there, you might be disappointed. So just Absolutely. keep that. And you ask about health, keep the love within and share it. That's, um, you know, and for you now, that's the photo of you on that, um, on the, uh, what the screen that, um, for the show, the intro, the intro. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's you on the, that on the, the photo that's on there. That's you, right? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, then get another photo, man. You look older on that photo than you do. Oh, man. It's the it's the lighting. So much younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, that was that was a time in my life where I was like, okay, yeah, I, I wasn't. I was eating all the bacon that you told me not to eat. That's what I was doing. So I, I, I laid out the bacon. Uh, that was a couple years ago. So I'm. I'm getting younger. Yeah, I'm no, back. no. Get, get another photo. You, you look. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know what? I'm gonna get a photo and put it on a billboard, and maybe me in some in some underwear somewhere on uh, these Dallas freeways. Well, just be careful before you get in your underwear and, and put it on. The, you know, just make sure. See, I didn't get a chance to see it first. I, I they didn't. They didn't say, Ernie, is this okay? They just threw it up there on the billboard. I'm like, well, hold it. Nobody talk to me about this. But um. <laughs> So but make you got, sure you, got you got see it before. You... Apparently, it, it sounds like you got pretty good feedback from the from the uh, billboard. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I I still see ladies who who saw it, you know, like <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be amazed where fans come from, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I did a movie called. Uh, I know we're about to go, but I did a movie called Penitentiary Two, and in the scene, uh, I was to take this potato salad and smash it in my girlfriend's face. And then I eat the potato salad off of her face and becomes this oh, man. love scene. It was, it was really kind of sick. But when I started <laughs> trying to eat the potato salad, it I almost threw up. Uh, it was just really bad. But when the movie came out, for years, women would come up and say, ooh, I got me some potato salad. So, uh, <laughs> you never know the reaction. Well, I think you just messed up potato salad for me for the rest of my life. So, <laughs> no, it's a, it is all good. But now we appreciate the the jewels and nuggets on, on life and, and and like getting to know you a little bit better and hearing your journey uh, throughout your your lifetime. And and, and like you said, I, I, there's so many similarities between what, what, you know my life and your life because uh, Marines and grandmother inspired. Yeah. And I even went to I was in San Diego for boot camp. Uh, at MCRD, right, right, right there, looking at the airplanes taking off every day, wishing I was on one of them every single oh, day. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, just uh, appreciate hearing hearing your story and, and you, you know, taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us in our military community. Great, I really appreciate you guys taking the time, and I really just so, so much, just respect, man, and appreciation for you. You know, I know everybody's journey is different, but. I can only imagine, but um, it's so good to see you representing and standing strong and, and sending this out here. You got, got, you're making a difference, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of that. So thank you so much. Absolutely. And if you don't mind hanging on until uh, after the live uh, so we can kind of say okay. formal goodbyes. But uh, uh, again, thank you for what you do. Um, and we, we all, we're all in this world together, and, and everybody needs each other to coexist in this world. And, and so what I do is to me is no more important than what you're doing or getting our mind away, you know, away from all the craziness that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and we're going to end the show right here and uh, chief chat out.